we have a problem. Sound familiar? That's the now famous phrase from the Apollo 13 crew, right? On their uh, moon journey. And the interesting thing was they were pretty much trying to send a signal back home that they were in some serious trouble. And I wanted to get in that same spirit tonight and give you a warning. Humans, we have a problem here on this earth. And that problem is very simply, our human lives are destroying our spiritual lives. Our human existence has the tendency to crush and to dwarf our spiritual existence. And we have got to figure out how to take our lives back and put our lives in the right order. And I know this personally, because one time when I was an 11 year old scout, I went to scout camp, my first scout camp ever, the biggest moment of my life. It was me turning into a man. It was going to be the greatest event of my life and I knew it, I knew it. And I went out, I was so excited. See, I was raised by my mom and my three sisters, four women that I affectionately called my pack of women. They were wonderful. <laughs> but one thing we didn't do is we didn't do a lot of camping. So when the 11 year old scout went out to go camping, this was the rite of passage. I knew manhood was soon. I got out there. This was the greatest moment. I got to go, you know, eat in the woods. I got to sleep in a tent. They even gave us what are called mills ready to eat, MREs, the military mills, right? And this was back in the day. Now they're not, now they're sealed in nice little bags, but back then they were in cans because you had to open the can and you had to open the can with a special can opener. And if you didn't know what you were doing, you could lose a finger, seriously. And so we went out to scout camp. It was the greatest thing in the world. As I'm getting my great little meal ready to eat, I opened it up and the first thing I noticed is that there were crackers in it. It took me about 20 minutes to get it open, by the way, and a couple of cuts on my fingers. But when I finally got it open, I ate my crackers. I was kind of uh, a little worried about trying to open any more cans, but there was another can. They're like little tuna fish cans. And this tuna fish can said the word preserve preserves on it. I had no idea what a preserve was. I was an 11 year old kid for crying out loud. And as I'm sitting there, I didn't know what a preserve was. I found out later it's jam, right? So I'm sitting there, we're listening to the scout master. We're all sitting around this incredible fire. I had never seen a fire so big. We'd even done some, uh, some snipe hunting. A super cool thing. By the way, never caught one the entire night, but boy, did we try. And uh, as we were doing all of this fun stuff, I'm sitting there with this sealed can of jam. I already had my crackers. Didn't know what to do with it. Our leader was telling us about Sasquatch and how he lived in the mountains. And if we hear any noises at night, be careful because he could come out at any time. And I'm sitting there listening and I just toss the can of preserves in the fire had no need for it. And we sat there and the, and the leader kept telling more stories and we got more scared and we all leaned in and we were all so excited. And all of a sudden, right at the moment of most fear, bam, the can exploded. <laughs> and this 11 year old scout had no idea what had happened, but everyone was burning and they had red stuff all over their faces. <laughs> And all of the scouts were screaming, my eyes, my eyes, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And I'm sitting there thinking, what's going on here? And somebody's like, hey, it's jam, it's jam. Who put the can of jam in the fire? And I'm like, who did that? That makes me sick. Who's gonna blow everyone up? In my head, I'm like, oh my word, I just killed my entire troop my entire troop. I went from the stud, the 11 year old coolest guy in the world to a jam bomber, a jam bomber. And I eventually became known as the jam bomber. Do you know what that does to a human? My identity, I'm a son of God. I'm not a jam bomber. I didn't even know this could happen. It ruined me. I was so worried. It took weeks for people to even talk to me again. You're the kid that burned us? Yeah, sorry. I'm just 11, I'm not even a real scout yet, but I'm, I might be soon. I thought that was the worst experience of my life. I really did. I thought, what could be worse than being an 11 year old known as a jam bomber for crying out loud? And guess what? Something was worse. 
because about a year and a half, two years later, I was in eighth grade, ready to uh, almost graduate and go to high school. And I went to a private school because my mom said I was that special. And I'm gonna go, and I, I was really there. I found out later to learn math. And, um, <laughs> but as the eighth grader of the, of the school, I was a big deal. I even had keys to the stage. That's how big I was. <laughs> I was on stage crew. And the funny thing about it, it was such a neat moment. They decided that they wanted to have a spelling bee. And the spelling bee was going to be from eighth grade down to second grade. And I'm thinking, got it. I'm a word guy. I'm a word guy. Back of my head, you're a jam bomber. You're a jam bomber. Do you not remember that? So I had this weird thing going on. Like, what am I really? I'm going to ace it. I'll be fine. I get out there. Spelling bee. My homeroom teacher was in charge of the spelling bee. It was such a great thing. I owned this moment. I got up there, second round. I haven't even practiced these words. Nobody gets out in the second round, right? <laughs> so I get out there. My teacher, right there. She says, Matt, I'd like you to spell the word lion. I'm like, lion? Like, lion around? I go, use it in a sentence. She said, the lion roared in the jungle. I said, oh, lion, L-O-I-N. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. <laughs> and right then, I heard little second graders gasp. Oh! <laughs> and my teacher says, no, Matt, that's loin. <laughs> right then, second grader called me loin boy. I went from jam bomber to loin boy like that, like that. And luckily the principal of the school wanted a teaching moment. So when she got up at the very end, she said, boys and girls, did we not learn a really important lesson tonight? We learned that we should think before we speak. <laughs> Thank you, loin boy. What's the deal? So am I the loin boy or the jam bomber? I thought I was a human being. No, am I a spiritual being? I hope. I need to somehow get out of this. We're sitting in a world where the world, if you're not careful, you will identify yourself as something of this world. And that is not who you are. I don't care who you are. If you're an 11-year-old boy or a 13-year-old boy, it doesn't matter in the end. We all have problems identifying ourselves as human beings instead of spiritual beings. I have clients that come and see me. One of the most impressive moments of my life was a 25-year-old man sitting at my desk, was his head on my desk, banging it gently and sobbing. This man has been battling cerebral palsy his entire life. And he was in the singles world and trying to date and trying to get a date. And he looked at me crying and he said, Matt, why can't I just be normal like everybody else in this world? And in my head, I'm like, loin boy, jam bomber. I had a 17-year-old girl come to my office. I was working with her, and she ended up, um, she'd been in a car accident. Her face was slightly paralyzed. She had some scars on her face. She had lost her equilibrium. She couldn't go do all the fun things she had been doing her entire life. And she looked at me, and she said, now what am I going to be? I'm not an athlete. I don't think I'll ever get married. I don't look as pretty as I used to. I've had people that are depressed and anxious that have, I've worked with, people with ADHD. We have all of these things going on with us and we forget who we are. And none of that is who we are. The best example of who we are, it was a great quote from a guy named Teilhard de Chardin, a Jesuit priest who said this quote, and it's so important. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. You are spiritual beings having a human experience, and your human experience has nothing to do with who you are. You lived with God, he knew who you were, he cares for you, he loves you, and he wants you to understand that. And as we are dealing with the human world, it beats us up. The Savior himself, when he came down here, he understood who he was. Do you remember, he was the boy that had to teach his parents whose work he was about. I'm about my father's business, so sometimes I'll come home a little late. It's a crazy opportunity, I think, for all of us to figure out how are we going to balance the spirituality that we need to try to grow into and the natural human life that we're living. When the Savior came here, he was the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and yet when he got here, he had no place to lay his head. 
He was the creator of all worlds, and yet when he arrived, he was just the son of a carpenter. When he went to Gethsemane to perform one of the most important acts of all of humanity, he bade three of his apostles to stay with him and watch over him. And as he went in, I believe terrified, worried, hoping he could live up to this important, this important task that he had to take on. His apostles, they loved him fully, and yet they slept. They slept through the atonement because they're human. And a lot of us have that battle. We don't know how to get our human to focus on the spiritual. So as we sit here, I want us all to be very clear. You are spiritual beings first and foremost. You always have been. You are sons and daughters of the most high God. You have always been a spiritual being. Your natural state is spirituality. You knew the Lord, you knew the Father, you lived with them, you cared with them. You were theirs and you weren't perfect yet. You didn't have a body yet. You had stuff to learn. You wanted the human experience. The human experience was something we all, we all were excited about. As we came to this earth, we had, or as we were living in the spirit, we felt peace. We felt loved. We felt connected, accepted. We felt confident with who we were. And because we were close to our father, we knew exactly who we were. We felt full, even though we had stuff to learn. We also had one of my favorite words, at one moment. We were at one with our father in heaven. And that at one month fulfilled us. And that is a pretty powerful thing. Then we come down to this earth and we have to battle some pretty crazy traps, okay? The traps I talk about are two very human traps. I call it the trap of the body and the trap of the mind. The human body and the human mind. And every one of us is battling it every single day. Did you know that they say it takes about two trillion cells to create a human being? Two trillion so a little baby has two trillion perfect little cells, I guess, right? If I asked you to fold laundry two trillion times, what percentage of the folds do you think would be perfect? How many of you have noticed because of uh, the DNA handed down maybe by your parents that it ain't so perfect? <laughs> and you're wondering like, what were you guys thinking? I wanted more hair or I wanted less hair and I wanted to be taller. And if I'm tall, I better ba bounce a basketball in our world. So we have all of these crazy things that happen to us because of these folding of the body. The body creates some of your biggest problems for you, doesn't it? It creates your body type. It creates your skin color. It creates genes. It creates a lot of your diseases, disorders, cancers, MS, Alzheimer's, all afflictions of the body. It can also create some other interesting things, addictive personalities and addictive behaviors. This body creates a lot of stuff for us. Some of us love it so much, we can't stop eating chocolate. <laughs> the body is not who you are because the body is nothing more than the shell to hold the spirit. We have all of these emotions that hit us. We feel flabby, we feel attractive, I feel hot. I feel hungry, I'm careful, pretty, fit, hurt. All of these feelings start to come in. And in a weird way, they start to dwarf the spiritual being that we all were. Because these chemistries, which is what the body runs on, tends to become more real to us than the spiritual promptings that we all know we've had. You are spiritual beings and I know you are and I know the body gets in the way because if you've ever in your life held a newborn baby, you know what the spirit feels like. If you've ever held the hand of somebody that was dying, you know what the spirit feels like. If you've ever served somebody and while serving them, felt an intense love for them, you know what the spirit feels like. You know, you know, you know. If you've ever just gone out to nature and been totally taken away in such a beautiful place, you know what the spirit feels like. The spirit is not just those feelings. That is your body that creates those feelings. The body is the first trap of the human life we live. The second trap is the mind. The mind I want you to distinguish is different than the body. When you sit there and you look in the mirror at your body and you think, I'm fat. That's probably not your body saying that. And I'm gonna bet it's not even your spirit saying that. I'm gonna bet it's something else. And I call it your mind. 
Your mind is part of that carnal experience we're having. And the mind was created, the carnal mind we know for sure was created with Adam and Eve in the garden. Do you remember they had bodies in the garden? They had spirits in the garden and they were operating and working with each other. They were tending to the garden, picking fruit, taking care of everything. They weren't necessarily progressing like they probably should have. Eventually they partook of the fruit and the minute they partook, the scriptures say their eyes were opened. And when they opened their eyes, what happened next? The first person they noticed was Lucifer. They noticed him because their eyes had been opened and he's the father of this carnal experience. The mind is different than just chemistry and feelings. The mind starts to create judgments, poor, rich, powerful, weak, secure, famous, humiliated, all of these judgments that we all go through in our lives. The mind has a purpose and its purpose is it wants glory. It wants power. It wants control. It wants all of these things. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit and their eyes opened, Satan, Lucifer pointed out what? You're naked. In my world, nakedness is, has another word or term we use in, in my kind of business. The word is vulnerable. For the first time, Adam and Eve felt vulnerable. They, for the first time, felt insecure. For the first time, if you remember, they started to cover up. They started running and hiding and fearing and shaming and guilting and blaming. They felt lonely They felt dreary and they were ejected from the garden. And when they were ejected from the garden with loneliness and fear and insecurity and all of these issues of the mind, plus the infirmities of the body, guess what happened to them? They felt this incredible need to try to fill these holes up. And I believe every one of us today in our human body and our human experience, we're doing nothing more than trying to fill the holes. We try to make ourselves fill those crazy gaps by being prettier, more powerful, more prestigious. We want more popularity. We want more profit. And when we have all of these things, we're confident it will fill the hole that was left when we left the garden, when Adam and Eve left the garden. And I'm here to tell you, it's a myth. You're never going to fill the hole by using your body and your mind to do it. There is not going to be a way through to spirituality through the mind. The the Savior said, your thoughts are not my thoughts, saith the Lord. Your ways are not my ways. So what we've got to figure out is, how do we get back to the spirit? Do you remember that 17-year-old girl I was telling you about? That incredible, young, vibrant woman who felt so bad because she couldn't smile like she used to. She taught me the way. And the way very simply was this. As we're sitting down, I had walked her through this model. She understood what her body and what had happened to her body and what that made her feel. She understood her mind and she understood her spirit. And as she was telling me her story, I asked her, can you see where you are when you feel desperate and lonely and weak and pathetic and insecure? Where are you? And she said, I'm in my mind. And then it creates chemistry in my body. I'm like, great. So where do we need to go? And she said, we need to find a way back to the spirit. How do you propose we do that? And she smiled and she said, I guess I just need to always remember him. I need to turn to God, she said, by always remembering him. And I asked her, how could we remember him right now? And she says, I'm not sure. And I said, imagine right now, you're weak, you're sad, you're so down, you feel so bad. What if the savior came in right now and sat right next to you? What if he turned to you right there and reached out to you right here in this room and just held you and you could just bury your face and your body into his grasp. She said, that would be so beautiful. And she started to cry. I said, what would it feel like? She said, I'd feel so loved. I'd feel so much peace. I'd have so much connection to him. I feel like we are one. And I asked her, so where are you now as you think about your problems, your your trials, your adversity? She said, now I'm experiencing him from my spirit. That's the only way, my friends, to get that peace and that joy and that at one month is we must learn to turn. And I promise you, when you turn, he will be there to lighten the load. I then asked her, okay, so what if when you turn to him, what if he still doesn't want to heal 
your scars. And she got a little mad. Why wouldn't he want to heal my scars? And I said, well, maybe he might need you to have them for some reason. Why do you think he didn't heal his scars? And she said, I guess so that we would always remember him. Is it possible, I asked, that he has you keeping your scars just so you'll always remember to look to him? I truly believe that everyone in this room can eliminate a lot of our angst, our pain, our judgment, and our human issues if we would simply remember that you're not a human being having an occasional spiritual experience. You are children of the Most High God who loves you fully, and if you will just remember it, notice where you are, and turn, he will be there for you. And when you turn, your spirit grows. And the Lord starts to change your life line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little, he changes you. And he changes your ability to change your problems and your pains. It is the most powerful thing. So right now, everybody think of what you're battling with. Where does your body beat you up? Where does your mind beat you up? And I want you to imagine the turn. If you in the midst of your biggest trial, your biggest pain could be held by the Lord, I want you to imagine what that feels like. If you could just release your mortal thoughts and fears and be held. And if right now you can feel that peace and that love and that joy, I promise you that's because he's there with you. He wants you to be better. He wants you to feel of his love. I promise you, if you will turn, he will be there. I promise if you knock, he will answer. It doesn't mean he will take away your scars and your pains, but he will give you the power and the strength through him to deal with them and turn them and convert them into something else. I promise you also this, he is waiting to be with you. He loves you fully and will feed you fully if you will turn to him. He tells us, I will be on your right side and on your left side and my spirit will be in your heart and my angels will be round about you to bear you up. Houston, we have a problem. Humans, we have a problem. And the only real lasting answer comes from heaven. I pray we'll all turn to God and look and live. Thank you. Thank you.